Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Today we're going to look at kind of a unique, cool piece. This is a 1969 Harman Kardon Model 520, and that's spelled out, which is different than the 520 listed on Google, which is an ABR. Uh, these were a very entry-level to moderate-level stereo hi-fi system, about 20 watts per channel. Uh, although, given the heat sinking, I'm not sure if it would actually sustain that. This belongs to a longtime customer. It's been in his family a long time. He recently inherited it, flipped the switch, did the smoke test, and it failed the smoke test. So, we need to figure out what went wrong, if it is repairable, and uh, what other things it may need along the way. And just taking this off of the mount here so I can show you a little bit cool thing about this is the stereomatic, I just cheesy central. So it, it looks pretty basic overall. There's no vents on the top. Uh, as was common of many 60s things, they just stuck the output transistors on the back of the chassis like this. These are missing some of their covers. So let's crack this thing open and take a look at the inside. Okay, so here's the top side. And very nice modular construction. Not sure why the tuner is crooked, although it may have something to do with keeping the flywheel on. This looks like your IF. Or actually, that's probably not your IF. This is probably your phone or preamp. This is your IF. This is your multiplex. This is your primitive regulated power supply. And then this is your amplifier. Now, what's interesting here are these bias pots, which I think somebody uh, may have replaced. Or anyway, there's your sliding tap. These look like they're broken. It's really weird that somebody would place these in here without adjustable wipers. Although the wipers are in different positions based on looking at the two. Let's see what the bottom side looks like. And with the bottom off, we see that we're greeted with lots of power supply and output capacitors. This thing here is likely a muting circuit or an automatic switcher for the stereomatic. This is your preamp board. The way these are designed, it basically comes in from the uh, input selector, uh, goes through a amplified tone network, and then finally your output is your volume. Some of these they run it wide open, and the volume is the only thing that just attenuates the input signal, though without looking at the schematic, I can only speculate. So these are very likely your output capacitors. Here's more filtering for your power supply. Likewise here, here's your main power supplies. This may be complementary, it may not be. It kind of looks like they have it set up as complementary. And then you've got these two transformers, which are your interstage amplifier driver transformers. So, uh, and interestingly enough, there's another potentiometer with a non-adjustable wiper. Interesting. So that must be a stock thing. I've never seen pots like that, to be honest with you. So now we got to figure out why this thing failed the smoke test. He says smoke came out, although I don't see any obvious signs of death. So let's try to figure this one out. So included with the set in an extra bag... Uh, are the output transistor covers, not sure why those were taken off, a rail fuse, which obviously goes on the back here, uh, another rail fuse holder, and another rail fuse, which is obviously open. Let's see here that that uh, element is no more. Or another fuse, which has no element at all, that's blown open, and a spade lug and a twist eye so yeah that's interesting not sure why he was taking all that apart but let's do a quick test of the output transistors and see if any of them are shorted and if so then we need to uh, hope that the driver survived and if not replace them basically I just want to get this thing to power up to see what kind of condition it's in okay given this is from 1969 I'm going to assume that these are silicon devices and so we should be able to get about a 0.5 or 0.6 drop across the base emitter junction. But 
that definitely does not look like that. In fact, that looks more like germanium. Unless they've got a uh, resistor shunting the junction. That looks like a germanium transistor. And let's see if this is complementary. That is a shorted base emitter. So that transistor is definitely unhappy. So this channel here has got an issue. And let's see here. Also shorted. And that's shorted all over. All three terminals are uh, together. Not good. And then let's come up to this one here. And again, we're reading what looks like a germanium. Very interesting. But that's short collector emitter. And that one was all shorted together too. So this has two blown amplifiers. And normally when it shorts collector emitter on the outputs and there's no failure of collector base, uh, you might be able to get away with leaving the drivers in. But when the uh, transistor shorts collector base, you now have usually rail voltage flowing back through the base into the previous stage, and it will attempt to murder the previous stage. Now we have one other factor, and that is driver transformers. Now, because of that, and there may be a low impedance, I have to remove these transistors and test them out of circuit because we may be reading across the windings of the driver transformer. So we can't trust, I mean, granted there are erroneous readings which would suggest the transistors are bad, but we have to make certain because the driver transistor or transformer does play into the circuit while testing them in circuit may throw things off. So what we'll do is we'll let me move this so you all can see it. We'll take out the uh, transistors here one by one and check them independent. I'm pretty sure they're trash. But I just want to be certain because sometimes the driver transformers, depending on how they're in circuit, will fool you. So let's go back here. This is a PNP. That is definitely germanium. That low junction is a germanium transistor. See now here, this checks okay. Yeah, there's no short here. So let me put a little mark on this. Put this in with a little green dot. So I know that that one's okay. And then we'll take out the adjacent. We'll check that one. And if the adjacent one's good, then we have to wonder, did the driver transformer fail? Which is really rare. But I'm not ruling anything out at this point. Because you just never know. Another interesting uh, observation on these older machines is that rather from the vantage point of the front, like this would be left and this would be right, they vantage it from the rear. So this is the right side and this is the left side. A lot of early stereo gears like that. So let's yank this out. So this should also be a PNP since they're both the same number. That one also registers... No short there. Okay, so out of the circuit, the transistors pass the junction test. It's not to say that they're not leaky, because most germaniums are, but that says that they're not shorted.
So we were looking into the windings on the driver transformer. Which means that further troubleshooting will be necessary to determine what's gone wrong there. Now let's take these guys out, since this one here was ultra scary, like shorted all three terminals. And let's see how this one measures. Let's take the little insulator off. That one does not look good. Yeah, so that one is in fact dead. Well, that's going to be fun. We'll probably have to adapt this to silicon because I don't have any TO3 germanium outputs and I'm not paying a fortune for NTE devices that are questionable. So let's go ahead and take the other one out and check that one. And if I measure this one, you still look alive. Yep, we do have a collector emitter short. Okay, so the left channel is decidedly dead. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to power this thing up without the output transistors in the left channel. We're going to put this fuse back in the right side since it was taken out. And we're going to see if the right channel operates. And if so, and the machine functions, sans left channel, we can presume that if we repair the left channel, that the machine will come back to life. Or at least, let me rephrase that, it will operate. So that will give us a better understanding as to what happened. Now, considering we have a driver transformer between the driver and the output stage here, uh, it may be that the, uh, the driver stage survived. However, if the short circuit persisted long enough, or somebody kept putting fuses in, which there's evidence of, then the transformer may have been hurt. And it may not be fully uh, known how hurt it was until we attempt to repair the uh, output stage. And uh, in order to do that, we'll probably have to convert this to silicon, which will be uh, changing some resistor values to properly bias the transistors. Um, so yeah, let's pump a signal through the remaining channel. We'll put it on the dim bulb tester just to make sure that we don't try to you know blow up what's left and see if it does anything else. Okay, so we got everything set up. Uh, on our scope, I'm monitoring the uh, working channel, which is the right. And we've got it on a dim bulb tester. So we're going to flip the switch. No smoke. Not much of anything. Make sure I'm pumping a signal through it. Yeah, I got up. Oh, we had something there. Nope, that was just a ground loss. So, so far, there is no sound and very little current draw. Make sure we don't have a touchy switch. Let's make sure I'm actually feeding it a signal. I'm just going to touch this to the output of the generator. Yep, we do have signal going into it. And let's see, we are on the... Oh, silly me. I have hooked my load up to the wrong set of speaker terminals.
Okay. It does help to hook it up to the side that's supposedly functional. So let's try this again. There we go. Okay. So our amplifier, that is the left channel, is still functioning. We don't have any visible distortion there on the scope. I've got a good volume range. The right channel is definitely the one that's still alive. So now we need to work on getting the left channel functional again. So let's get, see if we can get the schematic for it. And let's see how they have the amplifier laid out. Okay, so what you can get on this is the SAMS modular hi-fi components. Uh, this is the short uh, lib SAMS productions that did mainly stereo and stuff. So let's get down to the schematic and let's look at the, how the amplifier is put together. So the way that they have it here, you've got your driver board with your class, uh, your buffer, which is your input 701 and 703, and then you've got your class A driver, 702 and 704, which then fire into the primary of the transformers. And at the secondary, you have the two output transistors, and they're probably out of phase of each other based on the, the way the transformer is constructed. And so what you have to do is you can see the, the supply comes in there from the 2.5 amp fuse and goes to the collectors. Uh, the collector of one, or excuse me, yeah, the collector of one and the emitter of the other uh, through the resistors there, the 0.5 ohm, 5 watt. And then you have a 3.3 3, uh, ohm resistor that uh, kind of shunts that supply. And I'm not sure if the 3.3 3 ohm resistor is used to bias the transistor or not, because usually uh, they've got that feed resistor there, the 330 ohm, uh, which goes into the secondary winding which feeds to the base. So the way that you would up the bias a little bit uh, is you'd probably change the emitter resistor to a lower value instead of 0.5, you'd do like 0.3 or 0.2, and then you might be able to lower the 330 ohm uh, value to like, you know, 270 uh, 220 maybe to achieve the 0.5 you need across the two devices but we kind of have to play with that a little bit because you can theorize but it really comes down to uh, experimenting and getting it right so the first thing we're going to do is get some new output transistors in there of the PNP variety and then play with the uh, the bias components a little bit to see if we can get it to bias up so what I have on hand are these MJ21195Gs, which are overkill, uh, but they're a very good output transistor, perforated emitter, they distribute heat over the header very well, and uh, I'm not too worried about killing them. I think everything else in the set will die before these do, so we're going to fool around with getting these in here. I'm just going to slap some thermal heat transfer compound on them, and then uh, get them mounted. Okay. We got our output transistors mounted in there. We'll slap a two and a half amp fuse on this, hook a load up to it, and then uh, see what it's like before we do any modifications. Okay, so we're ready to fire it. The uh, bottom trace here, I believe, is the working channel, and the top trace is going to be the one that we just did the output transistors in. And so far, I have no sign of life from the left channel. So let's take some voltage measurements and see if the left channel is in fact getting power. I'm just going to rest this right here. We'll use the chassis as our ground. And we'll see what's happening to these guys here. That must be a speaker fuse. 
because there's no power there, at least that I can tell. And obviously, if this were bad, we wouldn't see that working channel. Okay, so let's compare. Got minus 19 volts there, minus 19 there. And let's go to the base, minus 240 there, minus 233 there. And if we go to the emitter, we have not much on the emitter, and not much on the emitter. Let's go to the out, outer transistors here. We got not much on the collector. Let's go to the... Okay, we got 19 there. 19 there. And then, let's see about that. 19 there. And 19 there. So, all the voltages are there. Why isn't it working? Well, there could be one of two problems. Why? Or maybe, let's go with three. Either one, there is no signal being driven to that amplifier. Excuse me there. Uh, which we can find with the scope in a moment. Just feeding the balance there. But we also noticed when we turned it on, there was no uh, thump visible. We saw a transient in the right side when we turned it on. So let's take this off the right load here. And let's poke around. We should be able to get something. Yeah, so there's our right. But there's nothing there. Yeah, power supply voltage there. Okay, so there is, from what I can tell, no signal getting here. But we have voltage. We have power supply and we have bias voltage as low as it is. We should see something there. We should see something with a lot of crossover distortion. So we've only got a functioning right channel here. So now we have to go back a stage. And just let me take the uh, left off here. We have to go back a stage. So I'm going to go to the collector of the driver transformer, the Class A driver trans, uh, transistor, rather. As you can see, on the right channel that it's working, we have a signal there. And here, we have a very noisy, very low signal. So this isn't working very well. It could mean this is open because we have something nice and clean there, but we don't have anything worth a damn here. So let's go back further. Let's go to another stage. So let's go to the input stage, which should just be an emitter follower. Let's uh, turn up the sensitivity a little bit so we can see what we're doing here. There's a signal there, a little bit bigger there. Uh, your input buffer's working. We got nothing there, nothing there. So far, nothing is coming out of this transistor, or going into it for that matter. So we've got no signal coming in here. See, at least with this, we have a little tiny signal coming in, which you can't see because my arm's in the way, but there you go. There's a signal coming in there but not here. Nothing is there. So let's turn this off briefly and make sure the device is not shorted. And then we'll have to go back further. So it makes me wonder if this failed and the owner of the unit just kept poking around until he blew something up. These are usually emitter-based collector. Come on. Yeah, that's a silicon device, so that's there. 
make sure there's no short. So this device, this input device here, nominally is alive. It's just not being fed anything, or it's being fed something so tiny that the amplification factor just is not there. So what we have to do now is go back further and see where the signal leaves. This is going to be fun getting all tangled up in this. Bear with me a moment. I only have the dim bulb there for safety reasons. So let's see if we can eyeball where the uh, signal comes from. There's not a whole lot of places it could be really. Give me a moment here to set up. Okay, so I'm a total dumbass today, and I neglected to see that one of the RCA cables had been pulled out of the RCA jack. So it ain't going to get any signal if uh, <laughs> the signal's being fed it. Um, so let's check here again. So that there on the left side, I have the right disconnected. That is our amplifier in its current state there and you can see that we have very little positive amplification here so let's just come back here let's take a look that looks happy now but that does not it looks very unhappy so yeah so that looks uh, uber distorted there. That looks just fantastic. All right. Okay, so obviously our Class A drivers do not agree. The fact that there's so much gain here versus this side could mean that a transistor is open. It could mean that a capacitor is open in the feedback of this amplifier, causing the excess gain in the distortion, or something unrelated. And I find it interesting that we, again, we don't have the uh, transient that we do with the right side. Pay attention to that. That's, uh, that's important. See how we get a little thump when we turn it on, the other one does not. So let's see how much power we can squeeze out of that channel before it gets really pissed off. Yeah, so something's wrong here. Let's just do a brief measure of the uh, collectors on the two devices them. So on the working side we've got 7 volts and on the non-working side we've got 14 volts. That's high. That suggests it's not conducting. And let's come down here. We got 14 there. Let's compare this 7 there. stuff out of the way so I can probe this. That's diddly squat there. Alright, so this isn't getting enough bias. And that probably has to do with this little trimmer potentiometer here. Let's see if I can actually adjust this without blowing it up. Move it small increments, and then we'll take a measurement here again. It's a little higher. We want to get it to about 0.1 volts across that device. I can't believe they made these things this way. This is just awful. <laughs> 
that's close. All right, so now we've got normal. They're about the same there. Let's see what our what it looks like. We've still got distortion, but that's probably because the outputs haven't been modified for silicon yet. And then let's take a look again at the signal. Yeah, we've still got some distortion there. Yeah, so that ain't right. Keep getting the way of that amp scope so you can't see it there, but that, that's garbage. That's not garbage. So I'm wondering if this is in fact defective. Let's just take a look here across this base emitter junction. It is biased, just like that one is. Collector emitter voltage there versus there it looks about the same. So this is interesting. Yeah, we just got distortion. So the distortion could be feeding back into this from this guy that's messed up. Uh, again, open cap. So let's see. Let's turn this off. And let's take this board up and pull the uh, transistor out. These just kind of snap up here, which is nice. Pull it up. And let's pull this device out. Let's see if I can get it to an area here where you can see it better. Well, that works, I guess. Let's uh, get the light on it. And then let's get the old device out. Thankfully, there's only about 14 volts on this guy, so I have a lot of selection as to what I could use instead. Let's see, did I do the wrong two terminals? I think I did. I think I'm supposed to do these guys here. Loosen up. All right. It's Yankee Yankee. And so there's our little bugger right there. Come on, focus, focus. Oh, seven, three, one. Anyways. The underside of that doesn't look too happy. Corrosion or it got hot. Let's see what the uh, diode checker says now that we got this out of circuit. And we'll go from base to collector as soon as I can get my hands on the device to hold it still. Base collector is alive. Base emitter is alive. So the junction test says that's happy. 
but you know, uh, yeah, not so sure about that. And then while we're at it, let's pull out the little device here. Although that said, it was good too. Uh, da -da 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 -da. And then we'll check both of them for betas and stuff because it could be that there's insufficient beta. It could be that the primary of the transformer is open. That would be a that would kill this project. Or again, we could have some bad capacitor in a feedback loop. That would be nice, but I'm not counting on it. I know everyone wants to say just replace all the capacitors first, but when you get problems like this, it's really not a good idea to do that. So that is out. All right. So let me get the transistor checker. All right. So here's the Class A driver. Let's see what it says about this guy. And it says that guy's alive. All right, let's check the uh, the other one. Really high beta on that one. Probably like a 2 n twenty two twenty two, But it says that they are alive so let's quickly check and see if there are any bad caps in the uh, amplifier, particularly the feedback loop. Okay, so we're going to check the couple of caps that are in the amplifier. I don't think this is going to be it, though. Doesn't tell us they're shorted, but these all look pretty happy. So... What we have to do now is check the driver transformer because if the driver transformer is bad, it's game over because he's not going to want to pay the money to find and acquire another machine to put a driver transformer in. So let's find the leads that go to the driver transformer which are usually in the collector circuit of the there we go usually in the collector circuit of the uh, uh, class A driver so I'm gonna do one here and one here we get 35 ohms on that side and we get 35 ohms on that side so the primary is alive uh, so now what we have to do is we have to look at the secondary. And so let's, first let's make sure that none of these are open. That's good. That's definitely open. Alright, so that 0.5 has got to go. And let's see here. Looks like the 330 ohm is still there. As is that one. Let's check the 3.3 ohm. Alright. So, that looks like it's there. So, according to the schematic, the yellow and green is one secondary winding. And the yellow is here, and the green is here, no. Uh, we got a cooked resistor back here, so we need to change those components. And my assumption is, is the distortion we're getting is probably just being fed through the feedback into this amplifier, since none of the components in the primary are faulty, which is good. So. We'll replace the emitter resistor and the 3.3 ohm resistor back there and then see if our distortion goes away and then we can work on fine-tuning our bias. Okay, 
So I have changed out the burned open 3.3 ohm resistor. I've changed the two emitter resistors and I've gone to a 0.3 ohm instead of a 0.5 ohm. And we're going to see now if that was enough to change the bias or if there's something else wrong. Uh, Because that very definitely would have affected one side. I ohmed out the secondary of the transformer, which seemed to be okay. So let's see what it does now. I suppose it's important to actually hook up the side of the scope I'm monitoring. And so we're not quite biased up yet. I don't know if you can see that here. Let's zoom in a little bit. But you can see the notch distortion there on the waveform. So we need to figure out, since it's a little more pronounced on the plus side than the minus side, let's see where our transistors are currently biased. That one's off, off, and that one's pretty off too. That one's at 0.2 volts. Let's test this one again. Come on, get a grip. Yeah, that one is very off. Okay, so we need to change some resistor values to get these things happy again, uh, you basically want to achieve about 0 0.55, 0 0.56 across the base emitter junction of each one of these to get it to be happy. So what we'll do is we'll figure out, and it's probably going to be through experimentation, uh, which one of these could either be these guys, we could lower this. Uh, let's take a look here again, because this is the base. But that doesn't get fed from the uh, 330 ohm. So we may have to increase or decrease these to increase the current through the primaries of the transformers. And so what I'm gonna do is, is just tack stuff in and just see what works. That usually is uh, the quickest way to do it. Okay, so I got some 390s tacked across the uh, the three 300s. Uh, let's see where that brings us. We still got a big notch there. So let's see what's across our junctions now. Diddly squat there. And 0.3 there. So let's see if we got voltage on this side. 18, 18. So in theory, let's see, I got 0.5 there. Yeah, we should be seeing a voltage difference here, but we're not. So I'm wondering what's going on there, although yep, these are still pretty cold. So let's toy around a little bit more. All right, so it turns out that one of the brand new emitter resistors up here was open. Brand new, it was open. Thank you, China. So I replaced that. And so now we've got about 0.3 across each one. You can see our notch has moved. Our notch, notch is now in the center, which says that there's at least equal drive between the two. So we need to drop this value down further, because right now it's about, uh, about 140 ohms. I think we need to get it down to about maybe... 182 that sh probably should provide enough current to keep that happy so let's uh 
get some different resistors in there. Okay, so playing around with this, I finally came up with uh, 120 ohms, which yields about 0.534 across each one. And that's about as good as I can get, any lower than that, and it's like 0.5859. You can see that the crossover distortion is gone. Both transistors are biased up nice. Uh, so I am going to get some legit 120 ohm 2 watt resistors because this configuration here is just kind of tacky. And uh, the 1 watt configuration I have it in is borderline. It's not going to last. So we're going to get some 120 ohm 2 watt resistors. And then uh, that will fix this one because it really doesn't need anything else. Uh, the tonal response is good. Uh, the phono and the AM and the FM all work. So I'm going to go ahead and order those parts out. And then when, when the resistors come, we'll solder them all in and make it happy. Because right now, it's doing pretty good. Uh, one thing I can do is we'll take it off the dim bulb tester. And we'll run it up and we'll see if I can smoke it. Because if it doesn't want to blow up, then that tells me that the amplifier really is fixed. And if it blows up, then obviously that wouldn't have been a lasting repair. So I would rather find out now than later on. When the customer takes it back home and then goes, what the hell, why doesn't it work? Or why did it only work for a short time? So, let's turn this back on. Alright. And let's just double check here. that We've still got our... See, this is actually a little bit hotter now because I've got it off the limiter. Yeah, this is more like a little bit on the hot side. Transistors aren't getting too hot though. They're just a little warm. I'm gonna let it run for a little bit and then we'll We'll crank it up and we'll see if I can get some power out of it. Yeah, it runs right up the clipping. And let's see what that clipping achieves. That's 10 volts RMS. Square it, that's 100. And divide it by 8. That's about 12 and a half watts per channel. So definitely not the 20. Of course, that could have been IHF. Who knows? But uh, yeah, that makes it work. So we'll get the uh, 120 ohm 2 watts. Uh, ordered out and then uh, that should finish this thing off so woohoo so to recap what we found uh, number one we had no signal uh, because I forgot to put the RCA plug back in but then we had distortion which was due to this open emitter resistor and open 3.3 uh, ohm feed resistor there and we checked these because we were getting distortion here, but I think that was just feeding back from the feedback loop and the amplifier because both those devices were fine. I adjusted the bias on the Class A driver, which was very low, so that will improve distortion. Um, and then we had to experiment with the right values of, trend, of uh, resistors to achieve the proper drop across the uh, PNP silicon devices. And... Um, 
yeah, so I'm going to get rid of this Mod Podge and we're just going to install a correct, um, yeah, the correct resistor value and power dissipation. And then that should take care of it. Um, in fact, I might actually just be able to go back to a 0.47 instead of the 0.33s, and then we won't have to worry about that being over-biased at all. So, that works. Um, yeah, out of curiosity, let's just, uh, let's check that real quick with a 0.47 ohm instead of a 0.33 ohm and see what we get. Okay, so with the 0.5 soldered in, we get exactly what we want our 0.56, so we'll just go back to, a. Uh, 0.5 ohm emitter resistors instead of the 0.33s. So we'll get those parts sorted out and then uh, slap it all in there and this should be a happy machine. Okay, so here it is all back together. We've got our 0.5 emitter resistors. I was supposed to get two watt devices but ended up with three watt. Whatever, uh, it's gonna work just as well. So it's the fateful moment. Let's turn it on. Everything stabilizes, and we get a nice set of equal channels here. Let's crank it up some. There we go, run it up to clipping. Got symmetrical clipping, that's really good. Let's see here. Let's make sure, oh yeah, our high filter has to be off. That's why I had such attenuation at 7K. That looks good. Got a little bit of clip there at a higher frequency. Let's back it off just a hair. And you can see the right channel has a smidge of distortion there right at the clip point. Otherwise it looks pretty good. 10K, looks good. And at 20K, you can see we have a little tiny bit of distortion on the waveform there, but that could just be because of the bandwidth of the transistors used. This is slightly distorted too, but when you run it up to clipping and it gets worse on the right channel that we fixed, you can see there that's pretty awful looking, a little bit of spurious oscillation. But again, only at 20K and only at clipping output. And if we go back down here to 100, we have good looking waveform there. right channel is a little bit more amplitude than the left, not much. Go to a 1K. So unless you try to clip it out, it's really good looking. You try to clip it out, you get some distortion there. Let's see if I can equal both channels. That's not bad. Let's see. Hold on a second. There we go, balance. Just make that happy. Now they clip at the same time. So we got the tiniest little bit of harmonic distortion on this wave. But that's really good without spending lots and lots of time on it. And this is just a a low power office machine so if we go below clipping let's say we go down to about five watts if we go down to five watts rather than at clipping go up back up to 10k we see that the waveform is absolutely clean and if we go to 20k likewise you only get the slightest little bit of distortion here and there and that could be bandwidth. It could want a lower bandwidth. It could be trying to oscillate. When you bring it up to clipping, it sure doesn't like that. So I might put a little bit of uh, compensation 
between the base and collector junctions of the outputs, but I don't think that's going to solve anything. Let's just check it real quick. Yeah, just out of added curiosity, uh, I added some capacitance between the base collector junction, but there was absolutely no change at all, so I'm not going to induce any more phase shift there. Uh, if it had the original output transistors, it'd be perfect up to clipping, but this is where we're at. Okay, so it looks like this is as good as we get here. You can see the differences there in my new silicon devices. It's uh, excellent until you get to about 18 kilohertz, and then you get a little bit of harmonic distortion, which is pretty good, uh, considering this thing was really a 20 to 20,000, so 18,000. Uh, and that's only at clipping. If you run it down to about maybe 5 watts or so, you don't get that. And since this is going to be used in an application with relatively low power, like in an office or bedroom, it's really not going to be an issue. Uh, so anyways, that's where we're at. This thing is done. Everything else on it works, so it's ready to go back home. So hope you guys enjoyed this. More stuff to come soon. So, bonus footage. It turns out that it's actually, uh, I'm an idiot. And the distortion we were seeing was in the right channel. Well, I fixed the left channel. But it's confusing because, again, they swap the locations based on where it is. Like normally on a receiver, this would be the left, this would be the right. That's why I was thinking right channel. That's why there was no difference when I added the capacitance. So, this is the left channel, which read perfectly up to clipping. This is the one that was breaking down and oscillating at bad frequency points. Uh, but unfortunately, the guy does not want to spend the extra bucks to have this side converted too. He just wants it to work right now. So we're just going to leave it at that. And so the channel I worked works perfectly. The right one's got a little bit of distortion, but otherwise, I'm happy with it. It's been cranking away here for about two hours. And it's just nice and clean, except for that little tiny bit of distortion at the high frequency point of the right channel, which I have not fixed. That's the original one. So, yeah. Anyways, sorry to be a pest. Again, thanks for watching, guys. More stuff to come.